So guys, this is actually a part two of my last vlog about making karate combative. I actually filmed this part two in the car yesterday, but um, the AC was blowing into the mic and uh, it didn't work out. So we're gonna shoot it again. The reason I was talking about my dream in the last video, one of the breakthroughs was that it turns your opponent into a faceless shadow. I'll kind of ex elaborate on that. I'm testing out this makiwara I just made. If you guys don't know what this is, this is a, a ski. So we'll see how it works. I just grabbed this rope from outside, so it's been sun damaged for years now. So I'm gonna go, go to Lowe's and pick up another bundle of this. We'll watch it break apart as, as we go through this vlog. So turning your pony into a faceless shadow. So what that means to me, both psychologically and then also combatively, right? So combatively, as you guys know, if you guys ever sparred, people tell you to look at different things on your opponents. You never want to look at the head. You never want to look too low. I look kind of dead center, like around this part, the, that V in your chest or right around here. The reason for that is I get to see all the peripherals. I see the hands coming up here. I see the legs coming from down here and I'm not distracted by one body part over the other. I was talking about enough with not to look at people in the eyes. The eyes can lie. You can throw feints. You can kind of intimidate your opponent to you if you look at their eyes, and I'll kind of go into that as well, because you want to think, if I'm looking at someone and I am assessing them as we square off, one of two things can happen. You can have a false sense of security, and the eyes and the facial expressions can do that too. That's like having having a poker face. I kind of pride myself in jiu-jitsu at having a good poker face when a submission is in. I'll probably pass out or fall asleep before they realize they have it in tight. That poker face, it buys you a few seconds. In a uh, competitive situation, that kind of buys you the opportunity to regain your cardio, regain your breathing. It doesn't show the opponent that you're injured or you're suffering. You know, when you're fighting and you're sparring, you're always, there's your brain's going like a million miles an hour with all these what if questions, right? Did I really hit him? Is he actually hurt? How's his breathing? Is he about to attack? This, this punch coming in is really gonna hurt. All these little things that are popping up in your head, especially if you're new to sparring, those things can be paralyzing because you have no idea what your opponent's thinking. And also, if you don't have control over yourself, then it's gonna be hard for you to execute what you wanna do. And again, this, always, this will all tie back to having a faceless shadow as your opponent. So again, looking at the face is, is not always recommended. You can see it in like MMA fights too, where people, you know, you have a minute between rounds and you have a minute to regain your breath and, and catch your breath and stuff like that. And a lot of times you see really motivated fighters, they'll look across the ring and try to assess their opponents. Are they breathing heavy? Did they drink a lot of water? Um, so that, you know, in the next round, I can hit them to the body and, and really make them suffer, right? So all these like psychological things are happening throughout the fight and they're happening instantaneously during the fight itself. And of course, you don't want to fixate on just the hands because they might kick. You don't want to fixate on just a takedown potential because you'll get punched in the face. So there's all these things that you need to assess and kind of realize that you got to look at the peripherals so that you can see the whole body as, as one. And you want to avoid the face because the face can lie. Another thing with that too, psychologically, if you're against someone who's like really mad or someone who is so much larger than you, so much more muscular and all these things, these are all physical attributes. You can be intimidated by just their, their presence, right? And that can be paralyzing. Tying all that back to the faceless thing, it's, the whole thing is like, React to the limb as if it's any other limb in existence. React to the kick, react to the, the tackle like it's just another limb that's aiding you in executing the technique that you train all the time. And that takes away a lot of the mental aspect of it because our sensei used to say, just do the kata, just do the movement. And if you trust in the movement that you've done, and I say trust as in you put in, I say this again over and over again, you put in the hours, you put in the partner, training, put in the high resistance training, pressure tested everything, you've put in the hours to fail, lose in the dojo so that you can win in the battlefield, right? Cry in the dojo so you can laugh on the, on the battlefield. It's how many times can you fail each technique 
so that it's perfected like a hundred times, thousand times, ten thousand times. Imagine that mentality multiplied by every single technique that you know. That way you're confident in your personal technique. And that way the person in front of you doesn't matter anymore. Because it's, it's just, hey, it's just another day at work, right? Another day of me just doing the same thing, right? I trust that this punch will always hit target no matter what. I trust that... No matter what, I can walk and go, right? Walk and go. I'm going to watch my rack break part. All these things, you can just trust in yourself. And that takes away the element of your opponent completely. Because no matter how big or how small, you're just going to do the thing. And that, that dream that I talked about in the last video, limbs were coming at me, but I did not see their faces at all. Big, small, trained, untrained, aggressive, compliant, you just do the thing and trust that your training in the dojo will make it work. So what do you guys think about that? What have you guys heard about um, where to look when you spar? Again, this is like the psychology of warfare type thing, right? Things on the battlefield. Because if you think about combat in split seconds, in split second increments, especially when life and death are involved, not just like sparring with your buddy or in tournament competition. But if I make a false move or if I doubt myself, that could be the end of the fight. What would it take you, what type of training would it take you to get to the point where the doubt for yourself is completely gone, the doubt for your technique is completely gone? How much training, how many hours, how much failure are you able to go through so that you can really trust yourself. And I think I talked about this in the video that, that I didn't publish, but it's like, regardless of who's better than me or worse than me or bigger or more muscular, more trained, etc. Um, if I enter a room, I can confidently say I will be the one that walks out. That doesn't mean I'm, I'm better than them. That means I have that survival mentality. And that's like a that needs to be number one in karate. You gotta train for that life and death situation, and I've talked about this before, and then tone it down for your training partners and tone it down for how do we how do we get as close to there as possible without injuring each other. Because there, there are stories of like Okinawans or Japanese people training and sparring without gear and like getting broken ribs and stuff, and then that's like, debilitating for the rest of their lives. People, I think people died. I don't know if that's real. People died from sparring, hard sparring, right? And then they had to tone it down and then they started using sparring gear and then they started just slightly touching the chin instead of um, going for the actual KO. So all these rules and, uh, and rule sets were made to protect each other, but it was just a compromise from what they're originally supposed to do, right? Which is Defend yourself no matter what. That brings me to like that Bruce Lee in Longstreet, right? He's uh, where he's teaching the dude and he's on the ground. He's like, what do you do from here? You're, you're in like a arm triangle on the ground. Uh, and Bruce Lee's like, you bite, you scratch, you do whatever you can. It's that survival mentality that you need to bring into the dojo so that you can walk out outside the dojo completely confident. And it's being very objective with it. Uh, assessing how you train and these are just common themes that are going to be running through all of my videos but it's it needs to be said over and over again it's if you're training for self-defense are you truly training for self-defense and and in the places where you have a deficit are you leaning into that or are you shying away from it right let's say i walk into a room and say man i could take everyone here except for that judo guy i bet he could throw me on my head well, I'm gonna spend the next five years learning judo. Of course, everyone has a family, everyone works, everyone has a job, um, everyone's busy, but approach your martial arts with that mentality. Go into the things that you're not good at. Growing up in the karate world, people were like, hey, I'll just never get taken down. Why would I even learn how to ground fight? I'll just KO him on the feet and then walk away. And it's always like that, what if? Are you literally going to just ignore that what if question? And the majority of people will. Right, and that's and that's that's kind of what got karate to where it is today, where it's kind of untested, and I'm making generalization. It's untested. It's performative. It's
kata based for tournaments. It's not reality based for self defense. And it stems from people shying away from the things that they're not good at or leaning into the things they're really good at. You could say, hey, I, I kick really high. I'm just going to keep kicking really high and kicking pads and, and doing spins and stuff like that. Um, which isn't to say that's not a, that's a bad thing, but you also want to think that's supplement to the foundation, the basis of combat self-defense. Like I always tell people, you you'll never, it's not like it'll never work, but you never will head kick somebody in the street. But if you're able to head kick accurately, then all those levels, uh, chest kick, uh, liver kick, uh, thigh kick, groin kick, all those levels below the head kick would be just as accurate if you trained all the way up to head kick, right? So it's like, have the ability to do that, but there are things that you're not gonna be doing in a real situation. Hope that makes sense, I think I rented and kind of trail off, but that's what these are for. Let me know what you guys think.